carbon monoxide poisoning. Prior to 2000, the most common cause of adult death due to poison in the United States was carbon monoxide. Now it's opiate overdose. So I'm going to give you a little demonstration. This is a carbon monoxide monitor. And I'm going to strike a match underneath it. And I'm going to read to you what the meter says. I'll shout out as soon as I get a number. It's going to start at zero, of course. Carbon monoxide in this room, I would assume. Power on. Please wait. This takes a little while to warm up. Preheat completion can be used. Ready? So 26, 42, 47, 51, 46, 59, 88, 115, 124, 123, 120, 110, 99, 86. Forty-one, thirty-five, twenty. 20. So it's gone down again. Now this is made to alarm and tell you when you're in a dangerous environment of carbon monoxide. It was up to 150 some and no alarm went off. Does that sound strange to you? Not, to, not Now that I know and I'm giving you a lecture, it doesn't sound strange to me at all. No. But some people think, and I'm not breathing that, some people think if you have one breath of carbon monoxide, you're gonna die. A lot of people think that. Well, we now know that that's not true. I put this behind the exhaust of my car and it read a thousand. And when I took it away, it promptly came down. And I'm over it, measuring it. So I'm getting, okay? Maybe that's all you need to know about carbon monoxide, but there's more. Now, what do you think was in the smoke that you saw? That wasn't carbon monoxide. That was, that's one of the things you call soot. Some of it is carbon, elemental carbon from the cardboard. That's not from the match. What's in the match you had this flash powder. That's antimony. It's phosphorus sulfide. And all of those things can be particulate matter that's in smoke. I was smelling that, and I smelled smoke, but none of that's carbon monoxide. Why is that? Because carbon monoxide is odorless, colorless, tasteless. You see that? It's slightly lighter than air, so it hangs around and it diffuses very rapidly, up or down. So it doesn't matter where in the room you have the carbon dioxide monitor. If you're going to monitor smoke, smoke rises. You want it on the ceiling or high. Carbon monoxide monitor can be anywhere. So in your boat, you're really not concerned with having your carbon monoxide monitor on the ceiling. It can be anywhere. It can be under, <laughs> under something as long as it's not hidden from the environment, somewhere in the environment. It can be sitting on your navigation table, if you like. But I had two carbon monoxide monitors, and they were both in uh, sleeping areas. Do you have a carbon monoxide monitor on your boat? No, do you? Yeah. yeah. Five of them. Five of them. Mm. by one, I guess. So. Or were they were they purchased at a hardware store or at West Marine? Uh, I think they were purchased uh, online. They were the ones that had the dual smoke carbon 
an oxide test and they're the ones that talk to each other. Oh, I was going to ask you that. If that one goes off, they all go off, right? That's right. And it tells you which one sends the, the, the fire or the carbon monoxide. Well, we're going to talk about monitors and what kind you can buy, and I'll tell you the kind that I bought. <laughs> You were smarter than I was, I think. Okay, when it breathes, you, when, when it's measured in air, it's in parts per million. But in the body, it's measured in something else called, called boxyhemoglobin. And that's what the important part is as far as symptoms are concerned. It combines with the hemoglobin 20 times faster than oxygen does, forming carboxyhemoglobin, which can no longer bind oxygen nor release oxygen. So if all of your hemoglobin has been converted, it's 100% converted into carboxyhemoglobin, you die pretty quickly because and you die of asphyxia. Same as being choked to death, you can't get any oxygen. Most people who are smokers have a constant level of carboxyhemoglobin of 5 to 9%. And we'll talk about that in a while. But just so you know, what its measurement in air is not the way it's measured in the body. The half-life of carboxyhemoglobin in the bloodstream is five hours. So in five hours, half of it's gone. Another five hours, half of that is gone. So it eventually disappears from the bloodstream if you just are breathing normal air. As, said, as we said before, it's measured in the air as parts per million. And what's a part per million? Just to give you an idea, one drop of food coloring in 50 liters of fluid, that's 13.2 gallons uh, of water, is, is about one part per million. And if you're going to look at it from the decimal standpoint, that's a tenth, that's a hundredth, that's a thousandth, that's ten thousandth, hundred thousandth million. So, um, if you're in a decimal point, there's five zeros plus a one, and that's one part per million. Measured in the bloodstream, as we said, is carboxyhemoglobin. 10% carboxyhemoglobin, and they have a blood test will show that. They have a colorimeter that will show that. No symptoms. I'm getting around to a slide that will show you what EPA measures in your office or whatever business you have because they want to know what your office carbon, carbon monoxide level is. Well, if you have 10%, you don't have any symptoms, so who cares whether you have 10%? 15%, eh, a little headache. 45% huh? permanent brain damage, 50% lethal in a few minutes. Now, on a boat, the most common cause is your propulsion engine or your AC generator. Now, gasoline produces more carbon monoxide than diesel. A well-tuned engine is better because it produces less carbon monoxide. It means more complete combustion. And these are other things, if you can see it, that produce carbon monoxide propane, butane, kerosene, any space heaters or fire made from those things will produce automatically carbon monoxide, but it, we don't worry about it because it diffuses into the environment quickly, but it can be a problem. Onan was the leading upscale generator, part of Cummins diesel engines. They made a lot of the AC generators and DC generators, but they stopped making gasoline generators for boats about 10 years ago because of that, because of carbon monoxide. Now, when the EPA and OSHA, that's the EPA stands for Environmental Protection Agency, and OSHA stands for Occupational Safety and Health Agency, they come into your office, they come into my doctor's office with measurements, and they didn't find any carbon monoxide, so they said, have a good day. If you're above 35 parts per million, which is a no problem to the human being, you can breathe that all day, 
and it doesn't bother you, but they have to pick a threshold, and that's the threshold they pick for industry. This level over time will accumulate in the bloodstream to about 5% carboxyhemoglobin in eight hours. Cigarette smokers commonly walk around with carboxyhemoglobin levels of 5 to 8% in the bloodstream all the time. Now the sensors are two kind of five parts per million all day, nothing. 70 parts per million for four hours produces a slight headache. And boat, boat monitors meant for boats usually don't go off below 180. 200 parts per million in one to three hours is similar to seasickness or flu. There's usually a headache, some nausea, ringing in the ears, tightness across the chest. If it goes up to 400 parts per million, then you only are down to about a half an hour to two hours. Vomiting, collapse, convulsions, and death at 400 parts per million in about two hours. So you need some warning, but not a warning right away when it first occurs. Oddly enough, symptoms won't wake you up. I've known uh, at least two people that were found dead from carbon monoxide poisoning, and they weren't awakened with it. Do you know anybody? You probably do. I'm not common. Now, I hate graphs on PowerPoint lectures, and I'm sorry, but I think this one is important. This is a graph, and I'll describe it to you. It shows parts per million on the y-axis, and time in minutes on the x-axis. And then these are the curves that show you carboxyhemoglobin and the curve will tell you how long it would take, for example, 400 parts to get to, this is the, I think the 5% curve, let me see. The lowest one here, here is 5%. You notice that there's one curve here that's blacker than all the others. Okay? That's the 15% curve. Uh, that's the one where things begin to get dangerous and symptomatic. Now this, you have it on your handout, and it reads off here the parts, the percent carboxyhemoglobin, no symptoms at five, 10 no symptoms, 15 slight headache, and, and so on, 20%, I can't even read what that says. At 20% it says headache. At 25%, it says headache and nausea is at 30%. And now you're following these curves on up. And that tells you the symptoms. And these curves tell you how long that concentration will be to produce no harm or some harm or serious harm. Now you're going to go out to buy a carbon monoxide monitor. My first stop was at a hardware store. And I noticed that they're $7 cheap. Uh, looks like pretty good ones, around $35. But none of them cost more than $40. Now that monitor, the industry requires that they alarm at the 10% carboxyhemoglobin level. And this is the curve, the 10% curve. By law, if you buy a carbon monoxide monitor, it has to, at a hardware store, for your home, not for your boat, but for your home, it has to alarm at 10%, carboxyhemoglobin. Is 10% harmful? Well, no. If you go back to the previous curve, this 10% line goes out, out, out. This is six hours, and it never does reach the symptomatic level. But that's industry standard, and we're going to live with that. I don't know whether I'm happy about it or not. Frankly, I don't care, but I, I, I agree that the alarm has to go off at some concentration. And it's really wise to have it go off at a concentration below where it's going to harm you. 
Yeah, it gives a good margin of error there. So. Yeah, right. Now this slide, I guess you have it. 50 parts per million, never any symptoms. 70, four hours, 150, 50 minutes. Now, the commercial monitors made for your boat that claim to be made for the marine environment don't go off below 180. We're going to talk about more about that in a minute. Let's go on. You go to a hardware store, and these are the brands that you see, Kitty and First Alert. I bought a Kitty. At the time I bought it, it was called the Kitty Nighthawk, and I paid $32 for it. <laughs> and I bought two of them, and I put them both in my boat. Now they're operated by a lithium battery that's usually not changeable. It, 10 years and that's it. It lasts, you know, what'd you say? Yeah, seven to 10 years. Yeah, about eight or 10 years. And the processor, processor doesn't last longer than that. So you throw the thing away, not only because the battery's dead, because, but the uh, chemical fuel cell is also dead. So you throw it away. And I can read this if you can't see it. I guess you could all see it. Now these are for household, but they work fine on boats, so that's what I had. Now let's talk about, you see that, I'm going to go back to that. See the price range, 6 to $35. Now you walk into West Marine. And the first thing you see, it's $109 minimum, and they go up to $144. It used to be... Uh, a different model, a different name, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Right now, this is what you see. It has no monitor on. You can't, it doesn't have a readout or digital monitor at all. And they have three models. The first model, and they all say CMD6, you can get one that's hooks to your 24 volt power source or your 12 volt power source. It also has a built-in battery in case your batteries go dead or your power source fails. So that's for backup. And you can attach it to your generator. So if the alarm goes off, it shuts off your generator if your generator happens to be running on the assumption that it's the generator that's producing the carbon monoxide. That's the expensive one. That's the $144. Then you can get one. It's called a CMD6MD but it doesn't have an R after the MD. Now that works with 12 volts, 24 volts, with a built-in battery, but there's no way to hook it to your generator. Then the third one is battery operated only with no hookup to your generator. But these all talk to one another. If one goes off, they all go off. And that's what it says, interconnected with other CMDs, monitor alarm. So that's the one thing you get with a West Marine, more expensive one that you won't get at the hardware store for your home use. Does anybody have a carbon monoxide home? I bought one for my daughter because her, light, her electric got one off one year, and they were cold. The temperature was like 10 degrees, and I took her one of these propane tanks with a space heater built on top. And I also said, I better give her a carbon monoxide monitor for that. And that heated her whole house. But it never registered one part per million of carbon. Isn't that amazing? There, was no, there were no yellow flames in it. It was all blue. So it meant that it was a very efficient. They call it Mr. Heater. I think you get that thing that screws on the top of a propane heater. And it, it's a very efficient heater. But... Hey, I'm, I'm proud of it. It's no carbon monoxide, at least not new. Maybe it needs adjustment after a while, but not new. Okay, a thing I don't like about these is that they don't have a digital readout. I like a digital readout to see actually what the level is. Uh, now, the ones you get at West Marine claim to be made for a marine environment. It means that they <clears throat> test them for vibration and shock. It's still the same as one you buy at the hardware store. It's time-weighted microprocessor, which means it converts the parts per million in the air to the percentage of carboxyhemoglobin that that parts per million concentration will produce in the body. 
and that's the micro the time weighted microprocessor. Now there are same electrochemical sensors, but the alarm goes off. I said 180. It's, it looks like it's 150 parts per million. After 50 minutes, 150 parts per million, but only if you have 150 for 50 minutes, almost an hour. Seven year end of life sensor. It replaces the Fireboy Xantex 12 volt CMD 4M. Anybody have that on your boat? If you do, get rid of it. This is the one that preceded this, the Fireboy Xantex. If you have this on your boat, get rid of it because they stopped making these. It's, fade, it's phased out from the marine store years ago. It has a sensor in it that's five years to the end of life, so it isn't going to work for you. There's no readout that you can tell whether it's working or not. If you don't have one, don't worry about it. The newer Fireboy Zentex model, it's quick installed to use the same screw holes as this one and to hook it up the same way as that. And that's one of the selling points that West Marine has for their new carbon monoxide monitor. What do you treat if you suspect carbon monoxide toxicity? Well, fresh air, oxygen, if available. Nobody carries bottled oxygen, but that'll get rid of it pretty quick. And that's what they do in the emergency room. They put a bottle of oxygen with 50% first and then 35% oxygen. And then gradually you're down to 21%. And they say bye-bye, they send you home in an hour. Half-life, and you know this, the half-life is five hours. And oxygen, supplemental oxygen will reduce that to one-third of five hours. Now, it's not all gone at five hours. That's half-life. So half of it's gone in five hours. And then another five hours, another half of it gone. So it's reduces gradually. Now the original ones alarmed, and I tell you this because I had a problem this way. Some of them went off with styrene odors of new boats, hydrogen emissions from charging your battery, cell phone frequencies in this certain range, possible cooking odors, operating temperature for the kitty in the first alert that you get to the hardware store, they don't claim that it works below 40 degrees centigrade or above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That dash doesn't mean minus 100 degrees, it's just 40 to 100 degrees. Whereas the Fireboy that you get for marine use says that it's effective minus 44 degrees to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're paying more for it, but I guess you're getting what you pay for. The older models, my kitty Nighthawk, and I have to tell you a story about a temperature in Virgin in Georgetown, Maryland. 207, I was tied up at the granary in Georgetown, and at 2 a.m. my CO2 alarm goes off. And I get up and look at it and it says 44 parts per million. I said, well, why is that going off? Well, then I remembered I bought it at a hardware store. And it really didn't tell me when it was going to go off. So I open up all the windows and I go out on the dock and there are three, three other boat guys out there complaining. They said the same thing happened. All their CO2 monitors went off in that Georgetown yacht basin. And if you've ever been in Georgetown, you know there's hills on both sides. Kitty Night House on one side and I guess the owner of a marina is on the other side. So it's possible that the topography allowed for a collection of air and there was a temperature inversion. So I guess we all had cheap CO2 monitors and they all went off at the same time. So that's when I wanted to throw my monitor away if it got me up for nothing. Now here's this hand sensor I just showed you. That costs 30 bucks. Here's one that you can get for 90 bucks. 
and it claims to see not only carbon monoxide up to a, a thousand parts per million, CO2, oxygen, hydrogen, methane, phosphine, a phosphine is like marsh gas, you smell it in the dirty marsh, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, ozone, and a few others. So that's a pretty good buy, I'd say. Now before I leave, I want to do this again over there in the corner. I stood right in the middle there where there's a flow of air. And I'll tell you what it shows. 1438, 84, 138, Attention, please. Carbon monoxide gas leaking. Please open the window and the door. Attention, please. Carbon monoxide gas leaking. Please open the window and the door. You've obviously hit the third. So the only difference was what you were talking about. So this went up to 240, and, it, and the alarm went off. Okay, any questions about carbon monoxide? I'm not proposing what you buy, because I would still buy the one in the hardware store, and I would live with the fact that it's going to go off probably at a lower level. Well, also you should know, since it's not marinized, it's not meant to operate in real low temperatures. If you keep your boat in the wintertime and you're not on it, take the back, take disconnect it or shut it down for the winter. <laughs> or move it into warmer area. <laughs> okay, eyes and ears. Uh, we're talking about mainly UVB, damage to the eye. Now this is typical snow blindness or UV blindness. Notice what happens to the cornea. On my picture, I see actually damage to the cornea. It's cloudy. So there's actually a, a corneal change from UV light. And you can get this as a reflection off the water as well as in, in, in air, uh, in, you know, looking up to the sun or just walking or, or, or being exposed on a boat. It's prevented by sunglasses or just regular glasses. Now this, I had a problem with this with a crew member in my boat. This used to be called, see the conjunctivitis? This used to be called saltwater conjunctivitis. People get splashed in the face with their eyes open. Or with a, not every time, because a lot of people swim in the water and they don't always get this, but some people do. And they're diagnosed as saltwater conjunctivitis because they're in salt water, but that can't be. Now we know what it's due to. It's due to this organism called Fibrio vulnificus. And if you have the right medicine, you can end it. I did not used to even consider anything about eyes until on a delivery of a boat from New England to, to Georgetown, Maryland, one of my crew members got splashed in the eye with a wave that hit the side, hit him in the face, and within a two hours or so, he was complaining about his eyes. And the next morning, he said, I, I've got to do something. About that time, we were off the shore of, of uh, Atlantic City, and although I wanted to go to Cape May and go through the canal, I decided for his sake I'd better get to a, a pharmacy very quickly. And I didn't have anything, anything on my boat to treat eyes. No eye wash, no eye cups, no eye antibiotics. Stupid me. <laughs> now you do. That guy never boated again, as a matter of fact. He was a neurologist uh, at Penn and he moved to Florida, so I don't think he ever yachted again. But we got him to Atlantic City, he managed to call his ophthalmologist off from a pharmacy. The ophthalmologist called the pharmacy and he got some medicine. He got the medicine called Toberdex and he put it in his eyes. And by the time we got through the canal, up the Chesapeake Bay, through the CD Canal, he was much better. And up to that point, he just sat mad in the, in the galley the whole time because he couldn't see and he didn't want to open his eyes. So ever since then, I learned my lesson and I ca carry eye wash. I have a, and that, it's called Toberdex and it, it'll show up in your medication list because that's one of the specific 
Tobramycin, that's one of the specific agents for this particular organism. Are these your prescription? Are these with a prescription, or can you buy them all? Yeah, you normally get it as a prescription, because the only place you can get it is a pharmacy, and they say, well, why do you need it? Who ordered it for you? They'll give you an argument, so you better get a prescription for it. <laughs> Tobradex is very common for eyes, and that'll prevent this or treat it if someone gets it. Or at least you have an eye wash that'll maybe prevent it or arrest it. So this is what I carry. Most ophthalmologists are doing away with the black eye patch. They say just put a dressing on it and tape it in, uh, tape it on and forget the eye patch. But this kind of looks cool, doesn't it, to have an eye patch like Blackbeard the Pirate. Now, uh, I talked to Howard, uh, Howard Couples about penetrating eye injuries. Any of you ever see penetrating eye injuries on your boat? I, I haven't. But he said, don't do anything. Just put an eye cup over it and tape it. And you know, people sweat a lot about their face, so that's a good way to have tincture of benzoin to put on the face of the staple, tape, the table stick. And he says, and get them to the hospital as soon as possible. If the object is in the eye, leave it there and just put the cup over top of it a big enough cup to accommodate a fork or whatever is in the eye. Uh, he said if you're offshore, maybe he would re recommend that you have sulfacetamide. That's a, another one that's on your list for any traumatic injury of the eye. That's what Howard recommended. Leave the object in the eye, cover it with a cardboard or styrofoam cup taped to the face as best you can tape it. Okay? Fortunately, I've never seen that. But I take Tobradex for conjunctivitis, and I tape, take sulfacetamide, which is meant for traumatic injuries of the eye if somebody gets scraped or punctured. And maybe it's not enough to have them go anywhere. They can live with it. You know, a penetrated object in the eye? I'm sorry, what was your question? There's a, an object in the eye, you wouldn't cover the other object. Oh, oh, yeah. I see what you mean, yeah. He, he said if there's an object in the eye, you put a cup over. But I don't, I don't think Howard told me anything to do with the other eye, but it makes sense if you cover the other eye so they don't swing their eyes back and forth complimentary. And then the tincture of benzoin helps the tape stick. Ear problems, well there's external otitis and internal otitis. External otitis is an infection in the canal. It can get so bad it gets pussy and usually when you pull on the ear like this, it hurts. Uh, you can have a middle ear infection, otitis media, which is much more serious, which also hurts, but it doesn't get worse when you tug on the ear. That's kind of how you tell you the difference. And usually otitis media inside on in the middle ear doesn't drain to the outside unless the eardrums are ruptured. Severe earaches associated with muddled hearing and fever is almost always otitis media. That's in the internal infection. So for external otitis, what can you do? You can make your own eardrops from vinegar and water. One third vinegar, two thirds water, two drops twice a day, and the symptoms should abate. So that's the cheap way to do it. Or you can get this prescription steroid and antibiotic neomycin, polymyxin, and hydrocortisone, and it has directions on the bottle uh, twice a day, for two or three days, two drops. Now for otitis media, that's usually can be a serious infection because it can cause a brain abscess. I carry z -Pak. You all familiar with z -Pak? Antibiotic. Uh, a new study says no, don't give people with otitis media antibiotics because they, they will get better on their own. But boy, they do a lot of suffering while they're trying to get better. 
but I still would take a ZPAC if I had it. Seizures and convulsions. Now this is where somebody shakes like this, but before that happens, they usually get stiff like, then they start to have the seizure. And it can start on one side and spread to the other. They're always unconscious at that point. Once they have bilateral seizures, they're unconscious and they're not aware of it. What do you do? Well, you've always heard of people biting their tongue when they have a seizure. Don't worry about that. Don't try to open their mouth or save the tongue. If they bite it, it's fun, finished, that's past. Just get them down so they can't fall down and let them have the seizure. Get everything out of the way so they're not bumping something because it'll end in about 45 seconds to a minute and a half. And then they'll usually wake up and they won't know, they'll know something funny has happened, but they won't know that they had all that shaking. Many of them are accustomed to it because they have a seizure disorder. But it can happen for the first time on your boat when you're on Route 65 <laughs> between Bermuda and St. John's. So let's go on. Don't try to restrain the convulsive movements. It'll stop in 50, 45 seconds or so. Assist the victim to the cabin sole or a bunk. Get them on the floor or on a bunk. Roll the victim to one side, three-quarter prone, prone to protect their airway. Make sure the airway is clear and that the victim is breathing. If not breathing, start CPR. Now, here again it says don't attempt to put anything in the victim's mouth or worry about a bitten tongue. Call for a rescue. Now there is a condition of status epilepticus, and that's fatal, and there's nothing you can do about it. In other words, the, the convulsion doesn't stop in 45 seconds, and it continues until they die. And you'll know about that because 45 seconds, minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, and they're still convulsing. That's not compatible with life. Now there's a, a drug that would again go to your prescription list. On, you go to a hospital, they give everybody Valium when that happens, or some other form of benzodiazepine, Xanax, Cirax, Ativan, which is on your list, will work. <clears throat> you can't give it to them by mouth because they can't swallow it. You could try to rub it on their gums, but the best way to give it is rectally, unfortunately. Valium is available in a rectal gel form. Versed is also a similar drug, midazolam rectally, or you can give it and rub it into the buckle, the gums. There are nasal forms, but not available as prescription items at a local pharmacy. They're only available in a hospital or in clinics like that. So I'm afraid if somebody has status epileptics, which can help with an alcoholic in delirium tremens, they're going to die. And there's not, you've done your best. You've provided a good surface for them to die on. <laughs> Abdominal problems. This is the most common thing when somebody says, I have a bellyache. In general, if it comes and goes, it's usually gas pains, and it tends to go away either after a vomiting, one dry heave, or a bout of diarrhea. So it's probably due to either a chemical that you ate with food, or eating, taking medicine on an empty stomach, or a virus. And I don't know any treat, good treatment for that. You just let it go and it goes away. We've all had that, in other words. May resolve with dry heaves or a brief vomiting or a brief diarrhea. Usually due to medication on an empty stomach or tainted food or unknown cause. So just wait it out. Now there's a so-called empty stomach syndrome 
It's also called functional dyspepsia. This is where you go without eating for a long period of time. Can that happen on a boat? Yes, it can. With foul weather, nobody can cook and nobody eats or has anything much to eat for a long time. And I know I get reflux if that happens to me. I get the empty stomach syndrome. I'm, I'm a victim of that. I have to eat sometimes just to relieve the distress in my stomach. Something new happened about 20 years ago, and they discovered that most of the symptoms for the empty stomach syndrome, where you get symptoms if you don't eat, is due to infection with Helicobacter pylori. Have you heard of that? Anybody hear that? It's a stomach infection, and it's treatable with an antibiotic. I've had it twice. It, it treated twice, and fortunately, I don't have any more. What would I have if I was in an operating room for a long period of time? Sometimes a seven-hour operation, ten-hour operation. I'm there. I'm not. Can't leave. And all of a sudden, my stomach it hurts so bad that I get the dry heaves and the nurses were used to getting the basin over while I had some dry heaves. And then in 10 minutes, it's all gone and I, I feel fine. And that's typical of Helicobacter pylori. They diagnose it these days by a breathalyzer test uh -huh. because the organism produces a high quantity of ammonia and they can detect it in your breath. So if you complain of stomach pains, when you don't eat for a long period of time, go to the doctor, he'll do a breathalyzer test, he'll say, oh, you got Helicobacter pylori, and he'll start you on an antibiotic in which the treatment's almost worse than the disease. <laughs> because the antibiotic that they use, you take for two weeks, and it causes diarrhea and stomach cramps, <laughs> and they warn you about it, but at least it cures Helicobacter pylori. I'm a victim, I know, but thank God I don't have it anymore. Anybody ever, ever suffer from empty stomach syndrome here? If you don't eat, you get symptoms. Intense stomach pain, nausea, dry heaves, resolves in several minutes. Play, eat something. That's milk and antacid. The purveyors of milk and antacid have made a living with this syndrome because it's common. And I take this medication, it's sometimes marketed under the name Pepsid, because this has Pepsid in it. So it's a histamine antagonist, H2 blo blocker that you can take for your stomach. When to worry about stomach pain? If it's worsening and associated with distension, then you've got a bowel obstruction, and you have to call for rescue for that. And that has to be unequivocal distension. The person can't just say, oh, I feel like my belly's big. They may have a sense of fluid, but when you look at it, they look the same as they did yesterday. It has to be distension that the other person notices. Now, another reason why you should call for assistance if the person has rebound tenders, they say it hurts in the right lower quadrant, you know, down here. And I'm a little nauseated. And I feel like if I have a bowel movement, it'll go away, but I can't have a bowel movement. Appendicitis? Could be. How about over on this side? Well, this side's diverticulitis. How about up here, gallbladder? All of those have conditions in which they perforate. Mm -hmm. And the classic simple of that is called rebound tenders. You push on the area of pain. Yes, it hurts. But when you let go, they go through the ceiling with pain. So when you, if the let go pain is much worse than the pressure pain, they've got a perforated appendix or a perforated colon or a perforated gallbladder. So that's one to worry about abdominal pain. So when I'm examining somebody, I'm always checking their belly, see if they got a mass, if it hurts here, hurts there. When you have kids growing up and you're a doctor, that you're doing that all the time. Oh, my belly hurts. But I always check, and if they didn't have rebound tenders, I'd say, oh, it'll go away, don't worry. <laughs> but when they have rebound tenders, any questions about belly pain? That's very informative. Now, I give you a warning because what you're about to see may cause you to use the barf bag. 
This is an open wound of the abdomen with the intestines out on the abdomen, that. Now, I, want, I don't want the first time you to see this to be out there. I want you to see it now, so when you see it out there, you know what to do. You really can't do much about it except keep it moist, put a towel over it, drenched with bottled water. Don't use that infection or anti or disinfectant water with betadine in it. Just bottle water over the top. Cover if you have saran wrap or something that's waterproof in the galley. Put that over the top and then tape it and call for rescue. A person can survive about a week with this and then they die of a bowel obstruction. This all gets infected and it dies mm. and it has to be resected. But if they get to it within a few days, not hours, but a few days, they can sometimes open the spot a little wire where it came out of and stuff it all back in, close it up, and it's like nothing ever happened. But it produces a bowel obstruction, so there's distension above that. So it's a serious condition. How did this happen? <clears throat> this was a kid who fell on a bicycle, 15 years of age, and the handle, you know, there's a rubber handle, came off, and he fell on the pipe, which was on the end that perforated his stomach. Now, when we, got, when we got the people from South Philadelphia, they were split with a knife. You just cram it all back in, take them to the OR and sew it, sew it up in there. <laughs> They're okay. So it's not really a serious problem because the treatment's fast. Put it back in and sew it up. Maybe put a drain in in case it gets in. Put them on an antibiotic. Are you squared away now? If you see this out there, you know what to do with it. Just keep it moist and call for a rescue. So that's the small intestine? That's small, yeah. The, the colon is too well fixed down to, to actually herniate like that. Cover with a dish towel saturated with saline solution. Uh, you can make saline, it, it should be slightly salty like the electrolytes in your bloodstream. So you can make that with a half a teaspoon of salt per quart of water and saturate that, make it out of bottled water. Uh, taste, tape it loosely on both sides with duct tape. Duct tape works fine. Maybe you need some tincture of benzene on the flanks to hold the tape for a long time and pick up your cell phone and call for a rescue. Heart attack, crushing chest pain. In women, it usually refers to the jaw. In men, it usually refers to the left arm, but not always. It can be just crushing chest pain. It's right in the center. It's not on the left. If somebody has chest pain here on the left, I suspect they have a distended stomach because that's the referral part for stomach is up here. They think they're having a heart attack, but that doesn't, that's, not where the, that's where the heart is, but that's not where coronary occlusion, the coronary occlusion pain is right here. And somebody aptly said it's like an elephant standing on your chest. And so it's very painful. Sometimes jaw pain, sometimes left arm pain, sometimes associated with per perspiration, dizziness and vomiting, and the person knows what's going on. And they're afraid of a heart attack. So they get an anxiety level that goes off, I'm gonna die. So how do you treat them? Nothing you can do because life and death depends upon the magnitude of the dead heart muscle. There's nothing you can do about that. You can treat the symptoms, pain and anxiety, so that you get out the Percocet and out the Ativan, get the Ativan out, and have them in a nice, comfortable position. They call it semi-filers in the hospital, semi-filers position. It's just sitting up, having the head above so they're comfortable and relieve them of all their duties. Call for rescue. Aspirin is always recommended at this point because aspirin can be an anticoagulant that may dissolve the clot that's producing the occlusion of the coronary artery or at least keep it from propagating. So if you have one adult aspirin tablet and they can take that by mouth, that's the best thing you can do. Pain relief, yeah, Alan? just recommend chewing the aspirin to get it active faster. Yeah, 
Alan said, chew it if you can stand the bitterness of the aspirin tablet, but you're right. Yeah. Pain and anxiety control are extremely important. Percocet or equivalent every three hours. You know, Percocet doesn't really last. They say every four hours, but I don't think it lasts four hours. I think it lasts three hours. So this is the time when you might give it every three hours. Ativan, one milligram every four hours. It's a prescription item. If coma, no pulse, no breathing, start CBR, CPR and use the AED if available. If no AED available and no response after 30 minutes of CPR, survival probability is nil given that you're hours away from rescue or days away from rescue. Now for respiratory conditions, this is cough, coughing up phlegm and I wouldn't worry unless the phlegm is brown or green. If it's yellow, I don't worry so much, but if it's brown or green and they have a fever, I order, I put them on z -Pack. So this is another z -Pack problem. It's for middle ear infection, also for anything in the respiratory tract. So I can summarize by saying you take, you can't take every antibiotic in the book. At most you can take two antibiotics. So if you had to choose to z -pack for all respiratory conditions, in the ear, in the face, mouth, throat, anything in the lung. And for everything else, abscess in the foot, ciprofloxacin. And there's another ciprofloxacin candidate that I'll go over with you in a minute. Now we're gonna talk about head injuries and we're almost through. Head injuries. Well, how do you get the head injuries and what are the considerations of having a bump on the head? Well, you'd like to know if the person was unconscious or not. That's one factor. If they're unconscious and lying motionless from a bump on the head, this is a fall down the companion way in which they hit their head or hit with a boom and they're unconscious and lying motionless and unresponsive for any length of time. You want to know that? Either of the above can be associated with a skull fracture. And I can, I can tell you why you don't worry about a skull fracture. And the causes are either fall or the boom, most commonly on, on a sailboat. Now let's talk about a concussion. It's a word that's passed around a lot. And few people know the actual definition of a concussion. A concussion, the diagnosis is not been made by an x-ray or an MRI or a CAT scan. It's made by a simple history. One question, the person hits their head and they remember everything that happened. They did not have a concussion. The definition of concussion is that you have a head injury and you don't remember. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're flat on the ground or KO'd, you know, like being hit by Tyson. There are football players at the end of the game are sitting in the locker room looking at the floor and they say, what was the score? Did we win? They play the whole fourth quarter and don't remember. Mm. So if you go back and look at the film, they were concussed. I use the word, but that's only a diagnosis in retrospect because they didn't remember what happened to them. I always think when I see a classic football play and I see somebody jump offside or a uh, premature start, no false start. Look at the previous play and see if they had a head injury. And they went to the right place, they did the right things, but they don't remember it at all. Now you make, that's a diagnosis of a concussion. It's not made by anything other than just that simple history. Now you can have a fractured skull and have no concussion because they remember the whole thing. I've seen patients come in with a hammer buried in their head, frontal lobe, and they weren't knocked unconscious at all. And we just took them to the auto break room and pulled the hammer out and repaired the bone, squirted it out and sewed them up. Uh, 
Is the skull necessary for survival? No, the skull has no useful function. It doesn't breathe for you. So an injured skull, whether it's fractured or not, is not a serious problem at all. Now there's some skull fractures that are. If it's a depressed fracture, what's stove in, and you see brain tissue oozing out around it, I'd call for rescue at that point. There's nothing you can do about it except keep it moist and put a bandage over it, just like you do for, for tissue coming out of the abdomen. Any tissue from inside that's coming out needs to be kept moist. Otherwise, the skull injury is of no real consequence. It can be associated with other things, but it itself is not vital. Treatment for head injury, no treatment. The brain will recover or not, depending upon the magnitude of the injury. There's nothing you can do about that. There's no medication you can give. Skull fracture is not serious in itself since no vital structure, not a vital structure requires no treatment unless depressed, which you wait. That can certainly wait overnight. If victim is unconscious, Forgo the usual neck immobilization and carefully turn the victim three quarters prone and I'll show you a picture of that. It's called the rescue position and you probably have all seen this or been told about it. No treatment for the brain, yeah, we did that. And that's the rescue position. And why are they in that position? That's because vomiting is common after head injuries. If they vomit, you want the, the vomitus to come out and not be inhaled if they're lying on their back. So it's the one time when you forgo the immobilization of the neck if somebody falls on their head. Usually you're told, if you fall on your head, always think about the neck. Yes, but in this case, you may want to carefully, because of the neck, potential neck problem, turn them to three-quarter prone position. And wait it out. They usually wake up within an hour to 24 hours and they should be fine. But when do you worry? Prolonged unconsciousness, more than 30 minutes, or poor performance after that. And they can't be the judge of it. You have to be the judge of seeing that they're doing strange things. They have the wrong line. They don't know what the sheet is. There's, if you put them on the steering wheel, they steer the wrong direction. So they have to do something that you notice that there's something wrong with them. That's when to call for rescue. Open skull fracture with brain tissue exposed, cover with a sterile dressing, should be moistened and cover with a head wrap. Call for rescue, yikes. Right. Now there's one thing I want to tell you about, and you said before, if I were on a boat and I knew what to do, I would do it. But you may be the only person who knows what to do. <laughs> for this condition, I'm the only person that knows what to do, and I would tell you what I'll do, but I don't know whether any of you would do what I'm about to tell you. And that's to put a hole in the head. Yeah. Do you see what's happening here? This is called an epidural hematoma. It's fatal, but it's benign. It can be cured quickly, and the person could go back to work in a few days. But left untreated, it's fatal. It usually happens with a head injury in which they hit the temple. They fall down, hit a table, chair, on the temporal area. The bone of the temporal region is the thinnest, e easily fractured. And there's an artery that runs in and out of the bone. It goes in and out of the bone, out of the bone, goes through the covering of the brain. And if there's a fracture across that, it can injure that blood vessel called the middle meningeal artery. And pretty soon you have, it's an artery, so it's really under arterial pressure. And it pumps every second, it pumps a few more cc's in. And, and you feel fine for a while. And then in a few hours you have a headache. And then 24 hours you're dead if it's not treated. So the pictures I'm going to show you is a Villanova student that I was called in on a Friday night to see. He was, got into a tussle with his roommate and he fell and he hit his head on the corner. He wasn't knocked unconscious. That was about two in the afternoon when they got back to the dormitory after first class in the afternoon. And then they all decided to go out to dinner and they wanted George to come with them. They went and George said, no, I really don't feel well. I got a headache and I vomited a couple of times. Just leave me alone. 
So when they came back later that night, he was unconscious. They called Bryn Mawr Hospital. The ambulance came and took him, and I was called, and I went in to see him. And the CAT scan is his CAT scan, which I'm going to show you in a minute. That's his CAT scan, and even you can read it. This is blood. This is a blood clot. This is the temporal region. And when I picked up his eyelids and looked at his eyes, the side of the hematoma, the pupil was that, and that's his normal pupil. See how much bigger that is than that? The dilated pupil is always on the same side as the clot, uh, the blood clot. And this is expanding. I mean, while I'm standing there look, talking about it, he's dying. So I called the OR and I said, I'm bringing a guy up to the OR right away. I pushed the cart into the elevator and I got him up to the operating room and we gathered people as we went along. And all I did was put a hole in the side of his head and the clot came out and he recovered. Now I did a few other things too. I shaved the head a little bit and made the incision. You measured how deep and I, it went in. I actually in. enlarged the hole. I put a few holes in so I made sure the bleeding was stopped and but he recovered fully and, uh, and was discharged from the hospital in about four days. What uh, but you can diagnose this on the boat. Happy and that's what you've got to use. And you put a hole in the side of the head. What did, sir? <laughs> this is the largest, the largest Black and Decker drill you get in the set is 5 eighths of an inch. Yeah, that's what I heard, 5 eighths. <laughs> I would do that. Now, I don't know whether you would do it, but if you want to do it, this is what to do. Get out your bracing bit, because that's the way we always, when I first trained, that's the way we always put holes in the head, it was with a drill. And you notice when you drill through plywood, when the drill gets through, it chucks a little bit. Bop, 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 bop. That's how you know you're through. So you slow up, and then you take the drill out, and you have a nice hole in the plywood. The temporal lobe is like a quarter inch of plywood, and the drill will chuck a little bit. And even if you whoops go through, you've got almost two inches of blood. That, there's no brain there. There's just blood that goes into you. say, whoa, 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 you can just take it out and not worry. But this under such high pressure that the blood or just shoot out in form of a dark blood clot out of And I, they may wake up even. Will blood clot, clot will come out. But will the vessel that's damaged? No, it'll still be bleeding, so you've got to call for rescue. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it may stop in time, but that's what I would do. Okay. Didn't you say a minute ago if you yeah, were I mean, aboard and you knew how to do something, you would do it? You've yeah. got to do what's necessary. Yeah. Could you put, why don't you get the open oh, and, and assuming that you still have a, a bleeding vessel in there, could you use sea locks? Yeah, you could, but I don't know whether it will get in there or not. I would. I would use sea locks gauze or sea locks. You don't want to pack it in like you pack it in here because you're just replacing a blood clot causing brain pressure with gauze causing brain pressure. But you, I would dust the powder in and see if it can stop the clot. Yeah. So I asked my wife to give me a hand, and I said, "Let me take a picture." <laughs> It's an inch, maybe a half inch above the ear and an inch in front. That's where the clot always is. So given the guy on, who hurt his head, maybe unconscious or not, but two or three hours he starts to complain of a headache and he's sick of the stomach. And then you find him unconscious. Look at the eyes and the clot's on the side of the dilated pupil. So this is where to put the hole. You can, if you want, go right through the hair, right through the skin, just drill. Well, and when it, when it chucks, it now it's going to bleed like crazy, but you can't be worried about that. You're trying to save their life. And that bleeding will eventually stop with pressure on the skull. What I would do is I would try to maybe take it, swap a razor there down to the skin and take my pen knife. You know, I have a very sharp pocket knife, make an incision, expose the bone. It'll bleed a lot because their skin, blood vessels, muscle with blood vessels in it. So you're going to go right down to the bone, right in and down to the bone. Nothing 
They're not going to damage anything vital. Now that you're on the bone, think of it as a quarter inch of plywood. Please replace the battery in time. Oh, this, this lady wants to be turned off. Okay. Power off. Okay. I pushed it before, but you got to hold it, it looks like, a little bit. So that's where you put the hole. I'll go back to that picture of the... You see where that clot is? The, the top one? The top one shows a fracture going down through, and this is the artery. Do you see it, a dotted line? That's what's bleeding, and that's where the clot is. Here's the ear canal. So you see a hole anywhere there, anywhere there will let out the clot and save the life. Oh, you can even make life easy. Now the problem with this is you don't sense the chucking, the ratcheting effect when you go through the bone. So I would tend to go back to the bracing bit. I'm sorry. Yeah, what kind of bit? <laughs> the wood, metal, masonry, what? <laughs> I think that's a wood bit. Yeah, you you take bit. what you get with a drill, don't you? Well, you can, with yeah, Black and Decker? You get a regular high speed bit, uh, but you're probably, if you want to buy it specifically for that purpose, get a double forcing bit, which is your yeah. flat bit with the point, and, yeah. and it's got two cutting edges on the edge of it. Because that'll make a round hole without leaving splinters. And since it's bone, yeah. you probably want you know, yeah. the uh, carbide. No. <laughs> so, so I repeat, think of it to make the incision with your box cutter down to the bone. Think of it from that on, Think, uh, don't think of it as a bone, brain, think of it as a piece of plywood and you want to make a hole in it. That's right, if you think of it like a piece of plywood, yes. Well, is it Quarter inch plywood. Most plywood I've drilled is not trying to get away from what you're <laughs> attempting to do. So is the individual at this point unconscious? He's unconscious, okay. yeah. <laughs> but it's a recoverable unconsciousness. That, and the reason okay. the dilated pupil is there is because the brain is pushed and a little bit of it herniates over an edge and presses on the nerve to the eye that regulates the pupillary size. It's very sensitive to pressure. Once the pressure's off, the pupil comes back to normal. I just thought anyone who's coming at me with a drill, <laughs> if I'm still conscious. Right. It's oh, no, they're not, they're not going to let you do it. They're not going to let you do it there. In fact, you have to wait till they're unconscious. And then I would start the ciprofloxacin because that's a serious infection and anything you can do to prevent it. Practical example. Anybody know who Natasha Richardson was? Liam Neeson's wife. Do you remember what happened in 2009? She was skiing at Mont Tremblant in New York. Or, or in, uh, Tremblant is about 80 miles north of Montreal. I've skied there many times in a place close to it called Gray Rocks. Uh, so I, I know what slope she was on. She was on a beginner slope. She fell, hit her head. I don't know what she hit it on. I, she may have hit it on somebody else's ski. Hit her the temporal area. She was not knocked unconscious. She was joking, alert for a while. Several hours later, back in the hotel, she complained of a severe headache, she then became lethargic, became comatose, and she was brain dead the next morning. Now, during that time, they took her to a small hospital in St. Jovite. It's a little town five miles from Montremont. They don't have any facilities. They do mainly orthopedic things because people break their legs they and their arms. Andrew? They don't have a neurosurgeon. I don't think they had anything. So they had to waste time they had a waste time sending her to Montreal. By the time she had Montreal, both pupils were dilated. And the neurosurgeon said, I, uh, I'm not forced to do a useless operation. Mm. So he didn't do anything. The family, by that time, the whole family was in on it. And they had a legacy at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. So they transported her to Lenox Hill. And because or she was already brain dead, there was no point in putting a hole in her head. So she died at Lenox Hill. What could have saved her? 
that could have saved her. Well, somebody observing the pupils and putting two and two yeah, together. Probably at, probably at St. Jovite. Uh, that's just a small hospital that deals mainly with orthopedic injuries. I'm not sure they even have a CAT scan that can get, that can get this picture that I showed you. This you can see, can't you? Yeah. This is brain. These are the ventricles that I can sell are distorted, pushed way over from the center. This is supposed to be in the center of the head. You see it pushed over. And that blood clot. I don't know whether they did a CAT scan at St. Jovine. But hours went by before she got to Montreal. By that time, it was too late. That was the next morning. Alcohol withdrawal, and we'll hurry along if you don't mind. There are some people that are alcoholics unknown to you and unknown to me. You invite them on your boat, unbeknownst to you, they want to pick that time to stop drinking. And this is what may happen. Now, I'm talking about somebody that drinks a pint of booze every day for weeks or months or years. And this is the scenario. What happens, there's an amino acid called glutamic acid. And you know all proteins in your body are made of amino acids. And there are 20 of them used by the human being. And uh, 11 of them are, are, are non-essential. That is, you make your own. And nine of them are essential. It means you have to get them from the food you eat and what you drink or vitamins you take. So all proteins are made of amino acids. And this particular one, glutamic acids, accumulates in certain areas of the brain when you drink alcohol a lot. And it is the most abundant excitatory neuro, that is neurotransmitter known to the human body. And, and when it's in excess, it produces agitation, anxiety, tremor, and palpitation. After 12 hours with an alcoholic who hasn't had a drink in 12 hours, this is what happens. This is the last drink. The drinker develops agitation, tremors, increasing heart rate, and says to himself, I need a drink. Now, that's the glutamic acid. By that point, it's not just a weak-minded person or somebody who's undisciplined. It's physiologic. It's built in. He's got glutamic acid in his brain that's accumulated over a period of time. In other words, he can't help himself. And that's what happens to most alcoholics. They get to the point they can't live a day without. So if the no drink is available, like on your boat, the symptoms get worse, associated with headache, loss of appetite, insomnia. And within 24 to 48 hours, the condition of delirium tremens sets in. Mental changes, hallucinations, seizures. We've always heard about the person who sees pink elephants. They see lots of things. They hear voices. They begin to sweat, sweat profusely. Dehydration becomes a major problem. And 15% of them are fatal. You don't want that person on your boat. What they tell us is now is not the time. You think you could rescue them by giving them a drink. But they're so dehydrated now that the drink will cause seizures. The only way you can treat them is with something that will break down the anxiety, the glutamic acid effect in their brain. And that's Ativan. Pretty large doses, 2 milligrams every 6 hours. And alcohol intake should not be used as a therapeutic agent at this point because it can trigger convulsive seizures. Statile, you know, then, and that's a fatal, you've got a fatal situation on your hand then. Now, I don't know how you can be sure that everybody you invite on your boat for the weekend or for a week cruise isn't an alcoholic who's chosen that time. I personally have not had the problem. I think I've known people that came on my boat well enough to know that there's a certain people I just don't invite. We talked about Ativan, hydration if possible, call for rescue. That's the only thing you can do for somebody in full flow. Now they're, they're seeing things and they're screaming and they're hollering. 
Oh, help me. Oh, I got keep them away. They're going to get me. Things like that. Alcohol should not be used. Now, I, we're getting toward the end. There's only, I think there's only one more subject after this that, that you should know about. But ciguatera, anybody here of ciguatera toxin? Well, I picked it because there are a lot of seafood poisonings. But I picked this one because it's tasteless, odorless. You can't, the fish tastes normal, and yet it's infected with ciguatera. I can't even pronounce this. Gambia, Gambia discus toxicus is the name of the organism. And these fish are bottom feeders. They're dwellers of the bottom. Predatory reef fish in warm water. All the common areas that you're likely to go to, Caribbean, Florida, Hawaii, South Pacific, particularly the Indian Ocean. And it accumulates in the bigger fish when they eat the infected smaller fish because the toxin stays. They don't even need the bacteria, they just need the toxin that the bacteria <clears throat> produces. Now I tell you this because I had a close friend, very well off, he could well afford his own 200 foot boat and he was eating seafood in the Caribbean islands and he developed this syndrome. You can memorize the term bags. It's barracuda, amberjack, grouper, snapper, parrotfish, surgeonfish, mullet, kingfish are the main ones. They all cruise the bottom. And a lot of them are ideal eating fish. So here's the symptoms. 15 or 30 minutes to three hours after eating, the toxic fish, you get drenching sweat, abdominal cramps, headache, numbness of the lips, mouth, and throat. It all, it all feels numb. Temporary blindness, possibly, we don't see right. Muscle twitching, hallucinations, tingling in the arms and legs. Temperature reversal in which hot, hot objects feel cold and cold objects feel warm. And the symptoms can last for months or years. With my friend, it was two years. Now, he didn't have this, this sphere all the time. Uh, it got better, and then if he would drink alcohol, it would immediately get worse. Mm -hmm. And it said it, that the symptoms are brought back by alcohol, shellfish consumption. Vomiting can, can be controlled with Phenergan. So if anybody has these symptoms and they've eaten the fish like that, you have to call for a risk because that's a very serious condition. Yes? If something like that happened on your boat, it's unusual that just one person would have right. eaten that fish. More than one, maybe more, more mean, than one person. I mean, is it something that would be unique to maybe somebody has a, a propensity, greater propensity to get this, or if it's there, everyone's going to end up with it? I don't, I don't think it's a propensity. I think everybody who eats the fish is going to get some variety of it. It's better or worse depending on how much fish you eat. But it's tasteless. You can't, you know, when most fish are bad, you can smell it or you can taste it. But this is one case where it isn't. When I lived in the Caribbean, they said, feed the fish to the cats. <clears throat> feed it to the cats first. Yeah, feed it to a dog or a cat. Yeah. Yeah, cats get sick the so what do you do? Don't eat predatory fish, okay? But all the fish that I named, don't eat them when you're in the Caribbean. If you insist, a guy named Gill who wrote a book on medical emergencies at sea said, feeding a piece to a cat or a dog, if the animal vomits, then fire up the grill and have hamburgers instead of fish. Bob fish mom. Now how about the unresponsive crew member? A crew member is supposed to come on watch at midnight or 3 a.m. and he doesn't appear. And you go down below and you find him unresponsive. What do you do? Uh, these are the possible causes of somebody who you find unresponsive and you call his name, he doesn't wake up, but he looks like he's breathing, he has a pulse. He could have had a stroke. And I mention all this list because there's only four or five that you can do something about. And you can treat all five of them because it won't hurt the patient to treat them. And, and if you get lucky and catch one, you may save their life. 
It could be carbon monoxide coma. Now, some of these you're going to immediately rule out by context. It could be he took a drug, a sleeping pill, or narcotic, or alcohol overdose. Possible. He could be hypoglycemic from excessive insulin with no food intake. Could be a diabetic. Or it could be the reverse. He forgot to take his insulin, and now he's in diabetic coma. Or it could be postictal, just had a seizure that you didn't observe, and they're always unconscious for a few minutes or an hour after a seizure. Or it could be shock from blood loss that you didn't observe. Or anaphylaxis could be an allergic anaphylactic shock. Or it could be ciguatera toxicity. Or he could be dead. Now, most of these you rule out by context, like the carbon monoxide. Nobody else has it. The hatches are wide open, so that eliminates that. If you know they're a diabetic, maybe you open the package, the, the envelope that he gave you, hopefully on the, entering the boat, and you find out that he's a diabetic. Well, that creates two possibilities, diabetic coma from no insulin or over-insulinizing and is hypoglycemic. So these are the things you can actually treat, hypoglycemia, carbon monoxide poisoning, opiate overdose, post state in which you just leave them alone and they'll get better, or anaphylactic shock. They're the only ones you can do anything about. And you can't do anything about it, any of the others. In fact, you have no way of even, even diagnosing it. So why not treat them all? Everything that you can treat. They should be flat with their legs elevated, fresh air, sugar rubbed on inside their mouth. It could be absorbed by the gums if they have hypoglycemia. Or it can be given by enema, three t tablespoons to a pint of water repeated in 20 minutes. We talked about carrying Narcon, Narcan with you because that'll reverse a opiate overdose. And of course, Narcan comes as a nasal spray. If a pulse is present and they're breathing and their breathing is intact, just roll them to the side, that rescue position that I showed you, and just wait it out. If the pulse is rapid and weak, then that is the one thing which heightens the possibility of anaphylactic shock. So if you have the EpiPen, you would give them the EpiPen. Death is not preventable by anything. If you've done all of those and they don't respond, and you've waited enough time for the seizure victim to wake up, there's nothing more you can do. If a pulse is rapid and weak, shock is likely, that's the EpiPen thing. Death is not preventable. None of these things that you do are going to be harmful, and you may just strike it lucky. If no pulse and no breathing, do CPR for, for 20 minutes and then make a decision. AED if available, okay? Now, how about death? How do you know somebody's dead? Well, the, di the definition of, of death is <laughs> you're not legally dead unless a licensed physician says you're dead. That's the way the rule says in Pennsylvania. So nobody can make the diagnosis except a licensed physician. That's kind of strange. That's being modified lately to uh, nurse practitioners and maybe, maybe PAs. But up to the time that I, times I practiced, this was the only way to talk about death. Well, what do you notice? Well, the person's motionless with no response to his name. You notice that he's pale and, or blue in the lips and fingernails. You notice that he's not breathing. You notice no pulse in the carotid. 
no response to pain, pupils dilated and fixed. They all, both pupils look like that epidural hematoma sign. That's the deaf pupil, the dilated pupil. And no corneal reflex. If you touch somebody's eyeball, they call that the fly sign. If a fly lands on the eyeball and the guy doesn't respond, they're dead. Because <laughs> there's something about your, your eyeball that causes you to wink or blink or turn your head. You can't stand it. So that reflex is gone. You can swipe the eye with a cotton or your fingertip tongue blade or something like that and you notice that no blink. Temperatures greater than 92, we talked about that. Now rigor mortis sets in anywhere from two hours and is present for 24 hours. That's where the extremities get stiff and they stay stiff because the electrolytes shift from inside the cell and out to out and out and in and the muscles become stiff and that lasts sometimes for 24 or 48 hours. A pathologist use that as a time to try to determine the time of death. If there's no rigor mortis, then they're dead less than two hours. If there's rigor mortis, then they died sometime in two to 24 hours. Now you can move the extremities, they're not that stiff, but they're in a state of rigidity. And usually everybody has a stool, their final evacuation, and urinary loss. And all people who die have that happen as their final automatic event. So what do you do with a with this person who's dead? You put him in the bunk? If he's in the bunk, do you cover him? What do you cover him with? Do you take a body bag with you? I don't know anybody that carries a body bag. How about a burial at sea? You don't have to answer. I'm just saying these are the things you've got to think about. How about dragging him overboard because the salt water will preserve his body if the sharks don't get him? Put it's a, called trolling in. Yeah. <laughs> Do you take photos? I would. Yeah. Do you stock a body bag? Whatever is done, the detail should be entered in the ship's log. That's the, um, that's the best thing you can do because there, there could be a lawsuit that comes out of you. And it's probably a close friend. Mm -hmm. I would probably put him in a bunk and put a, a blanket over him and just leave him that way. Uh, and, you know, uh, dead bodies don't really begin to smell bad for about three days and by that time the rescue will arrive. So I, myself, I would just put him in one of the bunks and him or her. Now the last thing I want to talk about is, a, is an itchy anal canal. You think, why would that come up in a lecture like this? Because if somebody has, has diabetes particularly and they have itchy hemorrhoids, that's a disabling problem. They can't wait to go below and scratch. It drives them nuts. So you should probably have in your bag something that relieves uh, pruritus ani, itchy asshole. <laughs> I always took, and I still have in my bag, nupercanal ointment, but they don't make that anymore. But there are probably a dozen preparation. Preparation H, there's a, a replacement for nupercanal is called Americane. But you probably ought to have something in your bag for that. Now, I, I usually go through this because there's dry supplies, there's wet supplies, there's medications that are non-prescription, and there's medications that are prescription items, and they're all in your handout. Other supplies borrowed from the galley or the toolbox. Well, vinegar for ear drops, ginger snaps, ginger ale, for seasickness, duct tape for strong dressings, and the Black & Decker drill bit with a 5 8 inch drill.
And then to remind you, there's, there's this marine medicine comprehensive pocket guide by Weiss and uh, Michael Jacob. And just to emphasize again that how important communications is to your overall medical plan. And that's the end. Thank you very much. Any questions?